Our scripture this morning is taken from Psalm 139, 1 through 6, 13 through 18, and Jeremiah 18, 1 through 6. This is for the director of music. It is a Psalm of David. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. And from Jeremiah. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house and there I will give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as it seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me. He said, can I not do with you Israel as this potter does, declares the Lord. Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, Israel. If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, and if that nation I warned repents of its evils, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. And if at another time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted, and if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good I had intended to do for it. Now therefore say to the people of Judah and those living in Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says. Look, I am preparing a disaster for you and devising a plan against you. So turn from your evil ways, each one of you, and reform your ways and your actions. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. Good morning. It's a privilege and a pleasure to be here, as I said before. It's always good to talk about God's Word and how God has affected us. Would you pray with me? Precious Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable unto you. For you are my rock and my salvation. Amen. Well, my journey started a long time ago. I was called into ministry when I was a very young teenager. But I could not do it. I had a problem. I was a very, very bad stutterer. And I was afraid to speak out, not to my friends, but when somebody came up to me and asked me something, I would start to stutter and they would say, stop, think about what you're saying. That made it worse. <laughs> I thought, I'm going to stutter more. Well. God had a plan for me. 
Now I have had an aunt and an uncle that thought that I should become a teacher. I didn't want to be a teacher. I wanted to be a secretary. When I was younger, back in the dim old age, <laughs> you could, the professions were nurse and teachers. Remember ladies? Yeah. Well, I did become a teacher and I taught for over 30, about over 33 years. Toward the end of my teaching career, I would say the last 10 years, I came out of the classroom and became a specialized teacher. I was a writing resource teacher. That meant that we would do creative writing, not handwriting, creative writing. And I had to do this in front of children, which I had no problem with, and teachers. But I got used to it. I also had to do in services for just teachers. And then I became, that was, I was one of the first writing teachers in the city of Camden. Then I became a computer teacher and I also had to teach adults. Well, came time for me to retire and I got more involved in church. I started teaching disciple. I know that you have disciple. You had disciple. Well, I have led about 40 disciple classes, sometimes three a week. I love disciple. It's one of the best things. Toward the end of disciple, you find out your gift. And they said my gift was apostleship, which means preaching. And I just I just got overwhelmed that they that it said that to them. But I kind of brushed it aside. But then I was asked to speak at our 175th anniversary. Now I was a member of a large church in New Jersey. By the way, I'm a transplant from New Jersey. <laughs> And I spoke to over 900 people. And I, when I sat down, one of my former pastors was sitting there and he said, you know the bishop's gonna grab you. Uh, okay, you know, brushed it aside. Then somebody else said to me, I became a, an administrative assistant at a church. And during one of the plate services, one of the people came to me and said, I want to be there when you preach your first sermon. Okay. Then all of a sudden, God was pushing me, pushing me. So I said, okay. I went to the church. And I said, I've been called to the ministry. So we went through all the steps. And finally I got my, I have had a church. It was a troubled church. But the district superintendent knew me because she had been the assistant at the church where I belonged. It was troubled because the gentleman that was there before came to the retirement age for pastors. When you come to the retirement age for pastors, you have to leave that church. You can preach someplace else, but you have to leave that church. He never told them why he was leaving. The first time I preached there, I felt a connection. I knew that God had me there for a reason. We fell in love with each other. 
and it was a wonderful experience. I had, I had seven good years there where the Lord guided me into helping them in growth. We had a lot of new members, a lot of new children coming in. But I had to leave it a year early, earlier. My husband had Alzheimer's and he was getting progressively worse. And it was a lot of stress on me. But when I look back at my life and the decisions that were made, sometimes for me, and sometimes I had asked for those decisions, I see how God had molded me like that potter. He prepared me to go into ministry. Now the teacher in me loved to do the disciple, of course, but with dealing of, with different people because when I was a writing resource teacher, I had five schools that I had to go to in a week. I had to deal with not only different teachers, but different principals, different administrators, different secretaries, and all kinds of, you know, people like that. And when I became a computer teacher, it was six schools. And dealing with a lot of different kind of people, you get to know how to, I think God gave me the, the right words to say at different times. One of the things that, one of the experiences I had as a pastor was that this gentleman came, he, he had come to a baptism and he and his wife really just loved it and they were very popular and he came all by himself. And I said, Where, where's your wife? Oh, pastor, I am just so upset because I told her something that I should have told her a long time ago. Before I was married, I had a, an affair with someone and I don't know whether I have a child or not. And when he told her that, she got very upset. And he said to me, if she leaves me, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't want to live any longer. So the bells go up in your head when somebody says that. I said, do you think you can bring her to my house tomorrow, tonight? He said, I'll stay. Well, they came to the house. Believe me, I was praying so hard. Oh, God, give me the right words to say. Give me the right words to say. When they sat down, they were apart. God said to, to me, and I said to them, I said to her, what do you love about your husband? And that was all it took. They got closer. It was just a wonderful experience to know God put those words in my mouth. He really did. So you see how God can mold you, can help you if you ask him to. One of the things I have found through my years is that we can't have joys. We don't know what joy is unless we've had some sorrows. Anybody feel like that? Yeah. You can't have good days unless you've had some bad days. Right? Okay. I have learned to find blessings anywhere I go. Less than five months ago, I was out in Ohio to celebrate my son's birthday. He had taken me to the 
Air Force Museum out there. He lived in, right outside of Dayton, Ohio. And it was three huge hangars of all kinds of airplanes. And he got me a little thing to ride around in because he didn't want to be, you know, dragging me. <laughs> well, we went to Chick-fil-A afterwards. That's my favorite place to eat. On the way out, they had a drive-through and they had these little lumps. Well, I tripped on it. I went down. My one foot, part of my foot went this way, my leg went the other way. And I said, okay, I know I broke it. It was very, very painful. But one of the blessings that happened, there was a surgeon from the base where my son works. My son is chief of chief protocol at uh, that base. We, uh, William Patterson, I don't know. One of those, it's a double name. This doctor came, he was right there, and he put his hand on my ankle to feel the pulse. And he had a, an assistant with him. And a lady had her phone out and he said, call 911. Tell them, and he said, boom, boom, boom. This will get the ambulance here faster. I said, you're a blessing. And I laid there for a while, and he turned to the, his assistant. She should be yelling and screaming at this time. <laughs> you know, it hurts, yeah, but yelling and screaming really doesn't do any good. So they took me to this, the hospital came. They um, gave me something to ease the pain. I called it happy juice. And... Uh, took me to this hospital. I had never been to this hospital. Of course, I was never in Dayton before. And the people just gathered around me. I had all kinds of doctors around me and everything. And the next day, they told me the next day they were going to this doctor, which of course I didn't know any of them, Dr. Weber was going to perform the surgery. And I said, okay, <laughs> you know, what else can you say? Well, he did, he put a rod in from my artificial knee to my hip. Now my artificial knees are 25 years old. The day after surgery, I walked up and down the stairs. And I'm walking today, most of the time without a cane. I have one with me. I call him George. I don't know why I call him George, but I know mean, why I do. When I'm outside, I need him just to make sure because there's many uneven spots. But the first day that I had breakfast, that was the day after the surgery, they brought me a tray. On the tray was a card with scripture. Wow, somebody came in and prayed with me. And when I went to the rehab hospital, oh, before I went to the rehab hospital, they said to me, if you don't feel comfortable going to there now, we'll keep you a few more days. Now, when, what hospital ever told you that? They're ready to kick you out right away. But that's the kind of hospital it was. How would I know? Look at the circumstances, the blessings that I had. The people were so fantastic. And the doctor that I had was really this. I told him, I said, you're a blessing. The day before I was going to go home, which I talked about, he sat me down and he compared the the x-ray from when I first got it done to that day and he showed me how many how it was growing together the bones 
And he gave me his card with his personal cell phone on it. He said, if you have any questions when you go to Pennsylvania, you give me a call. And you call my personal number. What doctor does that? And he said, give the card. Gave me another card. Give that card to your home doctor. Have him give me a call to let me know how you're doing. I said, you're a blessing. The people in the, in the um, they sent me to a rehab facility to help me and um, help me move around. And the people, the, the physical therapy people were just, per, just so wonderful. And I kept on saying, you're a blessing. The people that came in and changed my bed and everything like that, they would sit down and they would talk to me and I would you know, give me, give them, tell them about my faith. They were a blessing. You can find blessings in any way you have, any place. There's a scripture that I like to use. It's also from Jeremiah 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Blessings can be anywhere. You just have to find them and look for them. Amen.